On March 27th of 2020, the very long-awaited sequel to Mountain Blade Warband was released on Steam as an early access title. Mountain Blade Bannerlord received its first wave of mass feedback rapidly, as longtime fans of the series had waited a healthy 12 years for this game to happen. I was among those fans. Just four days after the game had come out, I uploaded my first thoughts review and... For those who didn't catch it, I was very excited. Yes! Yes! It's here! My body is ready! Banner Lord, descend upon me with thine grace! Descend upon me with thine love! I am ready! I am ready! And then, very quickly, I was disappointed. To very briefly summarize my thoughts from over two years ago, Bannerlord was a good early access game, but quite a letdown for a 12 year wait. It was buggy and prone to crashing, excused by the early access sticker slapped on it, but an excuse is only an excuse. It was certainly an upgrade from Warband, but that's all it was. It felt like a graphical overhaul with a few quality of life and reskin mods, which the community had already done 50 times over in far more creative ways. It just didn't live up to the hype. It was. Fine. I think a lot of people felt that way as well, evidenced mildly by the comments on that first video, but more so by the player count. Just a couple months after launch, less than 10% of people who had hopped in on day one were still hanging around. Normally, that's not entirely uncommon or even concerning, but given what a major release Bannerlord was and the average runtime of a given playthrough, those numbers aren't great. Well, it's been about two and a half years now, and the game is due to release fully on consoles and PC October 25th of 2022, so I figured now would be a good time to check back in. Both the game and my opinions of it have evolved quite a bit since launch, and I think it's time I talk about a lot of the aspects of the game I didn't give any attention to in the first video as well. So, let's get into the good, the bad, and the modding. To begin with, for prospective players and veterans of the series alike, let's talk about what I like about Bannerlord. Firstly, I love where they were going with the main quest line. We'll discuss the reason I say were instead of are later. In Warband, the only story quest you'll find is the very first one you'll do, which essentially acts as an extended tutorial. Bannerlord did much the same thing, but they took the word extended and ran with it. The main quest strongly encourages you to explore most of the map and establishes some actual backstory for a relic you are to put together, which will, in theory, give you or whomever you give it to the divine right to rule all the lands. Finally, I am very excited to see some story. I also really love the direction they took the perks and skills. The ability to tailor your strengths toward a certain playstyle was a great change, and for the most part I like how they've balanced things out in the perk trees over the last couple of years. The simple skill levels of Warband were fine, but adding perks into the mix in Bannerlord was a big win in my book. I sort of feel as though the focus and ability point system could use a breath of fresh air, but otherwise they've done well with this one. Another thing they've done that I quite like is the death and birth system. In Warband, the game would start with just under 200 lords roaming the map. It was very common in late game to see that number drop to below 50. This is often referred to as Lord Drain, and it happened for a number of reasons that aren't important right now. Well, they fixed that in Banner Lord with an updated death and birth system. New nobles are born constantly, all over, including those belonging to the player and their siblings if they so choose. Nobles die of old age, their grandchildren come of age and join the fray. By late game, you can end up with an almost entirely different pool of lords battling across the map. This keeps things interesting and dynamic and solves a big late game issue of the series. I don't think they've touched this mechanic since launch, but they didn't really have to. Well done. As for the nitty gritty, unit balancing has come a long way since launch. It wasn't too bad to begin with, but much like with Warband for a while, it sort of felt like each faction had that one unit that was just objectively the best at what it did and there was no reason to bother with any other unit of that type. The Imperial Elite Cataphract, the Kuzate Horse Archers, uh, the Batanian Fion Champion. You'd make sure you had a solid number of any one of these and you were on your way. After many, many, many rebalances, it really feels now like different units come with different advantages, armor, speed, range, and so on, such that each faction can really give any other a run for its money unit-wise. Mostly. 
horse horse archers are still OP. I mean, they kind of should be, but. Owning land, castles, cities, shops, it all feels much more meaningful now as well. Your trading has a very real impact on markets. Your decisions have a meaningful impact on the success and sustainability of populations. Who you choose to govern locations is a big deal. Overall, there's still a lot that could be done to improve these logistical systems, but they're a big step up from Warband and deserve some attention for it. And finally, since launch, there's been a lot. I mean, a lot. A lot done to improve the stability of Bannerlord. I mean, I haven't exactly counted, but I wouldn't be surprised if cumulatively, half of the notes in all the patches, hotfixes, and updates pertain to managing crash-causing issues. There probably shouldn't have been this many crash-causing issues to begin with on launch, but it's worth a gold star that they've done so much to alleviate this over time. I actually can't remember the last time I crashed in my last 60 hours or so of gameplay, even with mods. Overall, there's a lot I failed to give Bannerlord credit for in my first video on the matter, and a lot they've done a great job of fixing and smoothing since then. However, they've still got a ways to go. Remember my weird comments about the main story quest earlier? I said I really liked where they were taking it were was quite intentional, because since launch, they've hardly added anything to this half-baked idea. It was a fun touch to make you explore the world and find different people and learn the various perspectives of the kingdoms on a certain event, but once you do this, it really drops off. You go and meet a couple of once-important people who can tell you more about the Dragon Banner and help you put it back together. Uh, the pieces are conveniently held in nearby bandit hideouts, and once you've collected them, you must speak to both of these individuals again. One wants you to destroy the Empire, the other wants you to restore it. They don't care how you do it, they just want it to happen. Either one will help you restore the banner, but for some reason, only one of the two characters has actual in-game voice lines? For most of her dialogue? The banner of Calradius is part of a legend. And then you have the banner, and you can use it either as justification for creating your own kingdom, or give it to an existing kingdom ruler who will be thankful. And that's it. There's just so much more they could do with this, and they just haven't. Which is really disappointing. I'd love to see some more story in this very open game. I would love to see this quest take you to find another relic, or make you speak to minor factions, perhaps giving you alternate paths other than conquering the realm. I'd love for there to be any meaning or consequence whatsoever to giving the banner to an existing ruler. I'd love any kind of oomph behind this quest and story. Speaking of story, Bannerlord still suffers from many of the same problems as its predecessor, especially the hollowness of endgame gameplay. As I mentioned, they've alleviated this a bit by eliminating Lord Drain, but they haven't done a whole lot to make late game actually interesting, or even particularly different than mid game. At a certain point, you've got most things on lock, you've got your system for replenishing and training up your army, you've got the numbers and the power to wash over enemy castles, you've got the coin to upgrade every settlement you own. It just gets repetitive, and they haven't done much about that. One thing I think they could do to fix this is to lean into the politics of the realm a bit more. You could do favors for lords, gain their respect and trust, you can make friends and enemies, but there's honestly just not a lot beyond that. The influence system implemented in Bannerlord feels like it could fill a lot of this gap. It's a great thing they added, but there's just so much more they could do with it that they just aren't. Currently, you can use your accumulated influence to call lords and their troops to your army, to influence decisions on kingdom policies and decisions to a limited extent, and occasionally to complete certain settlement quests. That's it. Imagine if semi-random events occurred in the mid to late game that your level of influence would actually matter for, or if you could spend X influence to sway other lords from your kingdom or not toward certain decisions, or if you could use your influence to send spies, gain intelligence, wreak havoc on the internal politics of your enemies. There's a lot I can envision that just isn't there. Presently, the late game is almost as hollow as Warband. It can still be enjoyable, but god, is it frustrating to see so much potential just not being capitalized on. 
That last rant kind of leads into the modding section of this video, so I'm going to fast forward to that just a little bit. Just a few more things that I'd like to add to my list of gripes. Let's see... Uh... Oh, tournaments are still kind of a joke. I'd really love to see some more interesting tournament events and some optional difficulty added. Like, they're pretty much the same as Warbands tournaments. Um... Okay, yeah, smithing. It's just never really grabbed me, smithing. I, I gave it a shot my first playthrough just to see what was up and said, meh, and moved on. I mostly just see Reddit posts about people being annoyed by crafting a magnificent masterpiece and the customer being upset and paying a tenth of the asking price. So, I, you, you know, if you could make forging, smithing a bit more interesting, that'd be great. Um... Let's see what else on this imaginary paper here. Uh, oh! Prosperity in settlements is still annoying. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I understand the logic is greater prosperity, meaning greater food consumption, but mechanically, this means that there's a threshold where your settlements can become just too prosperous. To the point that everyone starts starving because they've eaten all the food and supply can't keep up with demand. Like, yeah, but... Uh, all right, I think I had one more thing in here. Uh, these, these papers actually have nothing to do with the video. This is just a bit, and these are all papers having to do with the planning of my wedding. Uh, oh! I found it! And finally, I'd really wish by now they'd allow greater interaction with all kinds of settlements. If one of my castles starts starving for one reason or another, usually because of prosperity stuff, I can have a thousand units of grain in my inventory, but I can't give them any of it for some reason? Same with villages, sort of. Why can't I just gift a village what a peasant would earn in their lifetime and boost that village to greatness while at the same time earning loyalty so I can recruit better soldiers from them? Ugh. There's just so much that seems so obvious, but it's not there. Anyway, that's enough complaining. Let's get into the modding. Though it feels a little unfair or even unjust to include mods in a review of a game, I feel like the Mountain Blade series is a bit of an exception. The modding scene is and always has been huge and frankly crucial to the series' longevity. As a matter of fact, in the making of this video, I had to double check all of my notes to make sure I wasn't at some point confusing something a mod had done for an actual vanilla update, and I feel like the same would happen to a lot of people in this position. It's just one of those games that of course you play it modded, at least after you've gotten the gist of vanilla. I honestly think if I had the mods I have now when Bannerlord first came out, or better yet, if m what my mods do were vanilla features to begin with, my original review would have been a lot different. Warband's modding scene was, or is, legendary. The sheer quantity and quality of quality of life mods, uh, meme mods, aesthetic mods, item mods, sounds, music, entire overhauls is brilliant. And after a couple of years, I can confidently say that Bannerlord's modding scene has almost kept up to par. We certainly haven't seen the same level of overhaul mods as Warband and Bannerlord yet, but man, are there some brilliant mods floating around nowadays. RBM, Realistic Battle Mod, uh, most of what Zorbarax did, but especially the Cut Through Everyone mod, Open Source Armory, Party Screen Enhancements, there are so many great vanilla-friendly mods that improve the AI, the world, how you can interact with it. Come, come to think of it, most of the mods I, and largely the community, based on number of downloads, love, focus on improving core elements of the game and addressing a lot of the improvements we all wanted to see after waiting 12 years for a Warband sequel. That's honestly a bit of a bummer conclusion to come to, that I'm now actually enjoying the game as a successor to Warband thanks in large part to the modding community, as opposed to the developers of the game. But at the same time, it's kind of fun. Yeah, you gotta put in the extra effort of going and finding these mods and installing them and getting your load order in order, but thanks to the amazing community that surrounds this game, this series, I can finally say in September of 2022 that Bannerlord is almost what the community was hoping for, thanks in large part to the community. So that's my new and current verdict. The game still has a long way to go, and I'm really excited to see how far they go with these updates by the time the game technically fully launches, but as of right now, I can actually recommend this game to people who loved Warband. If you're still playing Warband as opposed to Bannerlord because the modding scene is just too good, maybe consider picking Bannerlord up sometime soon. It's come a long way. So here's to another campaign. May your chosen faction or your own kingdom bring unity to the lands. Uh, but also Regea is the correct choice. And hopefully I'll catch you in my next video.